Father, we are so grateful to be part of your family, to be one of your children, to be your church in this community. Father, we are uh, we're humbled, and uh, Lord, we just pray that you would be with us today as we open up your word, that you would be glorified in it. In your son's precious name we pray, amen. Amen. How's everybody doing? Man, I appreciate our worship team. And when we uh, talk about, yeah. Oh, hold on a second. Oh, yeah, when we talk about our worship team, we're talking about more than just uh, the guys that you see up here. We got the guys that you see up here, but you have also the guys that are back in the back, back there running the equipment. Yeah, these guys. And, you know, I don't know that you guys realize how hard of a job it is to change lyrics for Tim. <laughs> you have no idea. You have no idea. Like, every Sunday, he's got this listing of, like, the way that it's going to go. And so they're ready to go, like, with these lyrics, you know. And so when you see the lyrics not matching the, what he's singing, it's because Tim's gone off script again. <laughs> yeah. And so... It's just part of the whole deal. You know, we were, we were having this conversation the other night about, you know, professionalism and, and everything and, and what it looks like to be a church and a consumer and a world driven by consumerism. And, uh, you know, we want to have a professional polish to what we do and we strive to do that. And we're always working to try and be a little bit more professional about the things that we do. But we never want to get professional to the point of hubris. Um, and, and pride, and, uh, you know, we always want humility to be built into what we do, and uh, so, man, I appreciate when we have to stop in the middle of a song to restart over again. There's just a certain level of humanity built into that that I think uh, you, you can really, you can program yourself out of that kind of stuff, and, uh, man, that's just no fun. I mean, Good grief, man. I mean, we could be just a concert if, you're, if we really wanted to, but we don't ever want to be that kind of church. We want to be the kind of church that has feeling and heart, and where actual human beings uh, go to church. And uh, so uh, I'm thankful for those guys and everything that they do, the work that they accomplish, um, even BJ. Yeah, I mean, even BJ, seriously. I know that's hard to believe, but yeah, even BJ. So we're, uh, we're going to finish up. We're not going to get to the last one of this series because we've got other things that we've got to do. We've got the church of the, uh, stay of the church address next week. Um, I know that that sounds boring, and we have to do it once a year per our Constitution. Um, and it can sound like it's, oh, well, it's just going to be, you know, dumb or boring or whatever the case may be. Guys, I would encourage you guys not to miss out on that because it, you need to know what's going on with your church. We have a representative government here where you guys elect representatives to represent you in the church council. Um, it's my responsibility to report on the health of the church every year so that you guys can see where we need improvement, where we need to, where we are doing really well. Um, and we always have areas that we can grow and work on. And so I would encourage you guys to be here for that. Don't, don't not come because it's the state of the church address. Um, come because it is the state of the church address. Um, and you'll be blessed for it because it's always good to see how God has blessed us. And I'm going to tell you, as far as churches are concerned, we're among some of the most blessed to come through all of this stuff that we have come through as far as uh, uh, social agendas and, and, and racism and COVID and, and all the other things that are stacked on top of all that stuff. Um, we did really well through all of that. God just really blessed us. And the main thing is that he blessed us with really great people um, and really mature Christians. And part of that is because of the work we have done here to build disciples for Christ. Uh, but, uh, but it's good to see that God is blessing us. Also, if you notice the faint odor of campfire in here today, along with a stinky person, uh, that is because our drop point guys are here today. They camped out last night in the uh, field out here. 
uh, with some of the boys, and so they froze to death last night, and they just came straight to church this morning um, from their shelters, uh, so they are a might rank, but that's okay. We love them anyways. I mean, Bob's always a might rank, but, but more so today, yeah. <clears throat> We're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter number 17 today, talking about one of my favorite stories. I shared a little bit of this yesterday at the men's breakfast, and that was a real blessing. Um, man, Rod, you guys did such a great job. I came in, Lloyd, uh, he was getting the prime rib ready. Lloyd was cooking up uh, 1,000 pounds of hash browns. Um, and uh, boy, what an, what an event that was. So great job, guys. You know, it's good. So we did talk a little bit about David and this whole kind of situation that happened with that uh, young shepherd boy and uh, the giant. You may have heard of that story. I don't know if you're familiar with it or not. Uh, you may have heard it at one point in your life. I'm not sure. Uh, but it is a, it is a uniquely, uh, it's a uniquely important story to Christianity because there's so many different parallels that you can draw from it. For our purposes, we want to talk about what we've already talked about, and then we want to expand on it today because we're going to really kind of narrow in the focus a little bit on what this whole having courage instead of fear looks like. And, you know, we talked about having those moments where there is fear and a need for courage, you know, stepping out of the boat or stepping onto the field with the giant, you know, when there's those things that rise against us and there's that moment where we have the, the decision to make whether we are going to flee in fear or whether we are going to stand in courage. Um, and that's not 100% accurate all the time because sometimes it's wise to flee with courage. Um, but, uh, but that being said, for our purposes, what we're talking about is the idea of fear. You know, what does fear look like? Um, and how do we overcome it? And so there's that moment where you have that time where there is this necessity to make a decision. Am I going to be fearful or am I going to have courage in the face of fear? And the thing that drives us to have the ability to rise to the occasion, to have the courage that's required to be able to overcome these things is belief, it's trust, and it's being able to praise God in those moments when we find ourselves needing to have the courage that we, that's required. And you can only gain those things if you have a desire to seek after God and if you live a lifestyle that demonstrates that you have a desire to seek after God. All of these components blend together into this moment where you can rise up, you can have courage in the face of fear and it will instill courage in you, it will instill peace in you and you will be able to face any adversary with the, with the courage that is required because of the belief, the trust, and the praise you have through a desire to seek after God and having a lifestyle that demonstrates you have a desire to seek after God. That's in summary kind of everything that we have put together so far, but let's expand that idea a little bit. And I know that this is gonna be almost impossible for some of you guys to read. It is on our Facebook page if you wanna pull it up. It's 1 Samuel chapter number 17, and we're gonna be going through basically the whole chapter um, and so as I'm reading, you can be turning there and then you can catch up. This keeps flipping off on me, guys. Um, 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse number 7. Yeah. Where am I at? Over here? Over here? <laughs> now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together in Shoko, which belongeth to Judah and pitched between Shoko and Ezekai, or Ezekah, and uh, Ephesdemim. Yeah, you, if you can do better, let me know. <laughs> and Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah, and the, set the battle in array against the Philistines. Now, obviously, there's a meaning behind all of these names we're not going to get into, but you may know the meanings to these names, and those are important because there's some really great stories in there. Verse 3, and the Philistines stood on a mountain on the, si on the one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side, and there was a valley between them. And there went out a champion of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span, which is roughly about eight feet, 11 inches. Really tall guy. Um, and he had a helmet of brass upon his head, 
and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of his coat was 5,000 shekels of brass, or about 156 pounds. That's a, a lot of weight. I know you guys have ever done any weightlifting before. If you've ever tried to lift 156 pounds, you'll know what I'm talking about. It's a lot. Um, most people have a difficult time benching 156 pounds, let alone carrying it on their bodies. You know, I don't even think that the full loadout for the military approaches 156 pounds. Am I right? I mean, what, what would an average loadout for, a, for an infantry guy be? Yeah, 20 to 30 pounds plus your pack, if you're like packing anything, would be what, 60? So you're looking at 80, roughly? Yeah, so unless you're Leslie. And then you're like 120, like, yeah. <laughs> right? I mean, I didn't say it. I didn't say it. If you didn't hear me, he said she carries my dead weight around. I just wanted to make sure everybody heard that. I didn't say it, though. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was a weaver's beam, and his spearhead weighed 600 shekels, which is roughly about 37 pounds, just the, the head of his spear, 37 pounds of iron, and one bearing a shield went before him. All of his gear was estimated to be around 270 pounds. Um, so you can imagine that this dude is just brawny, big, massive, terrifying guy. Um, there would not be a, uh, you would have to not be a not normal person to look out onto the field of battle and think to yourself, oh, well, yeah, I'll go out and fight this guy, no problem. Right? I mean, that's just not something that's going to happen. I mean, I think that most people were justified in thinking to themselves that we aren't going to go down and fight this guy. I mean, as a, uh, thinking from a military perspective, I think it was kind of a bad idea to let him go out and challenge everybody every day. I mean, I think I would have lined up about 100 archers, and then when he came out the next day, just destroyed him, I think is probably what I would have done if I was a general. Um, but I'm just kind of mischievous that way, I guess. But, uh, I mean, obviously, massive guy. Massive, massive guy. And he stood and he cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are ye come out to set your battle in array? Am I not a Philistine and ye servants of Saul? Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then will we be your servants. And if, you, and if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall be your, we shall be your servants and, ser and serve us. Uh, and the Philistine said, I defy the armies of, the, of, the, of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. And when Saul and, the, and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. I'd like to put forward that it's not just the Philistine that is terrifying. It's not just the fact that there's an eight foot tall or nearly nine foot tall guy standing there with 200 and something pounds of armor threatening to take out whatever champion you decide to send down. It's not just the conflict that is terrifying, it's the consequences of the conflict that's terrifying. Most of the time when, you, uh, when, when people back down from conflict or when people back down from, from even competition even, a lot of time it's because they fear the outcome. They don't know what the outcome is going to be, um, and they're, they're, the stakes of losing might be too high. Uh, when you're talking about like competitive sports, like say for instance Brazilian jiu-jitsu or boxing or whatever it is, you know, I mean, you know the state, what the stakes are when you go into it. The stakes are that you're going to lose and that you might lose face, but most people are going to respect the fact that you went into the ring in the first place to battle with someone. So the stakes aren't nearly as high other than like physical harm that might come to you as like if you were to enter into a, an arena with someone and the winner of that arena were to make all the people that you know slaves. The consequences of that are pretty high. So you don't want to be that guy, right? I mean, it's like not only do you not want to fight the nine-foot-tall guy, but you also don't want to be the guy that lost to the nine-foot-tall guy that enslaved the rest of your people. So before we get too carried away about the cowardice of Israel and the fearfulness of Israel, let's just put ourselves on that mountaintop for just a moment. How many of us would have ran down the mountainside to say, I'll take you on. I think if you were to look out at Christianity in general, 
you'd probably find a very few people that would have actually taken on that, cha- on, that, on that challenge, not only because of the opponent, but because of the consequences involved in facing that opponent, which is a sad thing. And, and it is kind of unfair because it's kind of hard to determine what we would do until we were in that situation. It's kind of like conflict in general. You don't really know how you're going to react in conflict until you're faced with the conflict itself. That's why a lot of, like, of, of boot camp and a lot of like police academies and things, the, the first things that they do is they try to do what's called stress inoculation. That's why they yell at you, and that's why they're really hard on you is because they want to accustomize you to the idea of stress and being able to overcome stress so that you're more likely to react in the way that they want you to react when the time comes that you have to make the decision to act. Uh, it's not as easy as it looks. And nobody knows what, they're go- what it's going to look like until you get in that moment. You, it, it, you just never know. And, and usually when you get in that moment, it's just such a blind fog that you don't really even know what's going on. It usually ends up being all about instinct. It's interesting because if you read any material on the psychology of conflict and the psychology involved in like, uh, in like police altercations, when they interview policemen at the end of a shooting and they ask them how many rounds that they shot, almost 100% of the time they never get it right. They never know. It's like they have no idea. So when you watch these videos where somebody is, is in an altercation with the police and the police just unload on this guy and you're thinking to yourself, wow, that was excessive. Not to them it wasn't. To them that was a totally normal thing and there's probably not a guy in that lineup that could tell you right offhand how many shots that he fired at that guy. It's just, it's just response, muscle memory. It's just reaction. Um, and so there's a lot that plays into the scenario that goes beyond just looking at a group of people and calling them cowards. There were plenty of really brave, really strong, really powerful men that were along that ridge that were facing this Philistine army. Um, so before we get too carried away, let's understand that right off the bat. This was not an easy situation, to say the least. But let's enter David. First Psalms chapter 17, 23 through 29. Now, oftentimes in Scripture, you find that in extraordinary circumstances, God pulls out of nowhere somebody extraordinary. We talked about John the Baptist last week. John the Baptist was an extraordinary character for an extraordinary time, set aside for an extraordinary purpose. Here we have an extraordinary event at an extraordinary time, and now we have an extraordinary person that has been pulled out of obscurity to face this challenge. It says, and as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the saint to the same words. And David heard them, and all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have ye seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up, and it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king, will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father house free in Israel. By the way, this demonstrates that Saul just wasn't sitting on his hands waiting for something to happen. Saul was actively pursuing the end of this event. I mean, he wanted to find his most powerful champion. He wanted to find his most powerful warrior to go in and to abolish this Philistine. The problem that Saul had was he was looking in the wrong direction. Saul was looking out to his armies to find the answer to the solution. You're going to find that David had a little bit of a different direction in the way that he looked to find the solution to this problem. And the men of Israel said, have you seen this man? And surely uh, the king of Israel said he would give riches to this guy. And then verse 26, and David spake to the men that stood by him saying, what shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine and taketh away the reproach of Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Who is this guy? I mean, really? This guy's going out and he's defying the armies of the living God every day? Who does he think he is? This is kind of the mentality that David has right from the get-go. And the people answered him after this manner, saying, So shall it be done to the man that killeth him. 
And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when David spoke, when he spoke unto his men, and Eliab anger, Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and said, Why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? You know, as if David is this kind of uh, irresponsible shepherd. We're going to find out a little bit later in the story that David was anything but an irresponsible shepherd that would have left his sheep, his father's sheep, unattended so that he could be there. In fact, when Eliab said this, he already knew the reason that David was there. He knew David was there on his father's command to bring them the, the, the supplies that they needed to carry them through the whole event. So this thing wasn't Eliab trying to point out some kind of naughtiness in David. This whole thing was Eliab's anger because he, because David was doing what Eliab knew that he should have done the entire time. It was guilt. It was shame. It was reproach. And Eliab's trying to say, hey, you know, you're, you're, you're naughty. You're filled with pride. We know why you've came down here. And, and this is the phrase that we talked about yesterday at the men's fellowship, and we'll talk about a little bit today. And David said, what have I now done? Is there not a cause? We've heard this kind of verse of Scripture preached about many, many times. And I think it illustrates something about David. David came into this situation, saw an extremely fearful moment and with with dire consequences and he looked down at this moment and he didn't think wow look how powerful this guy is what he did was he looked down at this moment and he said is there not a cause he had a philosophical difference about the way that he approached this conflict than everybody else. Everybody else was looking at this conflict and saying, it's too big for me, he's too powerful, the consequences are too high, the stakes are too high, there's too many things that could go wrong. Everybody was coming up with all these things in their head that, that said, we cannot take on this giant because of X, Y, or Z reason. David, on the other hand, philosophically, he comes up to the thing and he says, this is the armies of the living God. What are we doing? Who is this guy? Is there not a cause? Which tells you something about David fundamentally when we start looking at the way that you overcome fear. Now he turns to the crowd and he says, and, and he says some things after the same manner and the people answered him again after the, after the former manner. This is just all about David getting a flash mob together is really all this is about. And when the words were heard which David spake, they rehearsed them to Saul. They go and tell Saul about what all David is saying. And, and of course, if you're Saul, then there's a lot of pressure that goes into this. You have a guy out in the field that's saying, hey, you know, who is this guy? What are we doing? What's the problem? Why are we not taking care of this? Is there not a cause to defend? And the crowd weighs in. Saul has to capitulate. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Thy servant, I, I'll go. I'll go fight this Philistine. It's kind of like one of the moments, like, I can imagine like Saul's tent is just like a bustle with activity. You know, and Saul's talking with his guys, and they're trying to figure out what they're going to do. They're trying to feed the army. They're trying to make sure they have water. They're trying to make sure that all the animals are taken care of. They're trying to make sure that all the armaments are taken care of. There's all this bustle of activity and everything. And, and, and Saul's like, you know, what are we going to do about this guy? And he's like, who is this person that I'm hearing about David? Somebody comes in. They start talking about David. And he's like, what's going on? And there's all this conversation outside and everything. And then I imagine that David comes up, and he says, I'll go. And then there's just like this lull of silence for just a moment. It reminds me of that moment at the Council of Elrond. When, you know, I, I mean, Boromir has just got done talking about, no, you don't just walk into Mordor, you know. And they're all arguing about who's going to take the ring. Who's going to take the ring to Mordor and put it in the fire? Who's going to do that? And then little tiny little Frodo Baggins of all people, not even wearing any shoes, steps up and he says, I'll take it. And then there's just like this, this wash of silence as people realize that he's the only one that could. I can imagine that's kind of what was happening at this tent, this kind of feeling that everybody was having when David said, no, I'll, 
I'll do it. I'm, I'll, I'll take care of this situation. And then Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he, made, and he a man of war from his youth. This is Saul now trying to figure out excuses as to why he hasn't gone down to take care of this situation yet. He's a man of war, great age. I mean, he's a powerful man. You're just a shepherd boy, a young shepherd boy. What do you think you're going to do? And I love this response because there's nobody else that I know that has this resume. Maybe you guys know someone. And David said unto Saul, thy servant kept his father's sheep. That's an important point. And there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him. And I smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he rose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go. Go. I mean, how do you argue with that, right? I mean, how many of you guys, by raise of hand, have known someone that has smote both a lion and a bear with his bare hands? Raise your hand. Yeah, and I don't know anyone either. In fact, I don't know anybody that's done either one of those things or even came close to even thinking about doing any one of those things. Usually when we see a bear, our first thought is not to go and grab him and smote him. Our first thought is to run like crazy. I mean, that's probably a bad idea, but, but that's our first thought. You know, I mean, it's like it's, these are terrifying creatures. I mean, you think about a lion, I mean, it's no joke. I mean, I picked this picture because I think it accurately portrays what David may have been looking at at the moment when he smote the lion and took the lamb out of his mouth, and then the lion's like, what in the world? What's going on? And then that's when he grabbed him by the beard and then beat him to death with his bare hands. That's impressive, guys. I mean, I think it abolishes kind of all these images of this pasty, kind of thin-framed, kind of pale, ruddy boy stepping onto the field to face Goliath, you know? I mean, I envision uh, David as this strapping young lad, powerful um, and able, and filled with confidence because of the things that he has experienced beforehand. And that's all really, really important to this conversation. Because it's what David teaches us about courage at this moment that is really relevant to our discussion on fear and courage in the face of fear. One of the first things he teaches us is his obedience to his father and the positions that that put him in, that put him to the test. You know, one of the things that we, that we oftentimes don't consider when we're doing ministry or when we're working with other people to accomplish ministry or when we dismiss doing ministry because we don't want to get involved or because we don't have time or whatever the case may be, Thankfully to God, we don't have that situation here. Mostly everybody that is in here is involved in some kind of ministry. I would tell you that no matter what you decide to be involved with, be obedient to God's will for your life. Be obedient to the word of God. Because when you're obedient to the word of God and you're obedient to the will of God, what happens is, is in the process of that obedience, in the process of keeping those sheep, God's going to present you with opportunities to grow. He's going to present you with opportunities to overcome. He's going to present you with opportunities to exhibit patience and to grow in wisdom and to produce fruit as a natural progression of growth. The reason that a lot of believers do not grow is because they choose not to be active in the work of God. 
You have to be obedient to the work. You have to be obedient to the word. And being obedient to the word isn't just sitting at home and reading your Bible and becoming very knowledgeable about the word of God and then doing nothing about the knowledge that you have. If you are that person that you have collected a vast amount of knowledge about the Word of God and you are doing nothing to disciple someone, then what I might say to you is, is be obedient to the Word of God. Go reach and build. Go out, share the Word of God, preach the Word of God, and baptize those people, teaching them to observe all things. That's the only way that we're going to overcome a lot of the situations that we're in, and that would be obedient to the Word of God. And in the process of that obedience and in the process of that desire to seek after God, what you're going to find is, is God's going to present you with opportunities to try your faith. That's why in James chapter 1 it says, count it all joy when you fall into diverse trials. Because the trying of your faith works patience. And patience, wisdom. Without the trying of your faith... You don't necessarily grow in wisdom. You don't necessarily grow in patience. You need to have those things worked out. It's like a muscle. Your faith is a lot like a muscle. If you don't work it out, then your faith gets weak. Your strength gets weak. Your, 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 your desire to seek after God begins to wane, and it begins to get, to get anemic. And I really feel like we have a vast swath of Christianity Today that is very anemic when it comes to serving God. Very weak, very pallid, very passive. I said it before, I'll say it again. We've got to be done with passive Christianity. We have to be done with it. Just sitting back and hoping that God does things for us, that's not the way that he planned it. It's not what he intended to do. You know, one of the greatest things that demonstrates the sovereignty of God is that he relinquished some of his sovereignty to the church to give us responsibility. He said for us to go and to preach and to teach and to baptize. That's our responsibility. Could God have done it? Absolutely. He's the sovereign God of the universe. He could have snapped his fingers and made everyone on the earth believe in who he was. But one of the greatest demonstrations of sovereignty is to be able to relinquish control. Because only those that have control can relinquish it. It's an interesting philosophical discussion. You can try that out later. His previous experience with God gave him faith, belief, and trust. And this is all that whole belief and trust and praising him in the moment. You know what I mean? It's like... David demonstrated a desire to seek after God and obedience that came from that, which demonstrated a lifestyle, a lifestyle that demonstrated a desire to seek after God. So when he got to this moment, he wasn't looking down at the field and running in fear. He was looking down at it. He was praising God because of what God was going to do. He said, that same God that delivered me out of the hand of the, of the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, that's the same God that's going to deliver me out of the hand of that Philistine because I know what God can do because I believe him, I trust him because I have a desire to seek after him. That's the difference. He didn't look at the giant and fear the giant. He looked at the giant and thought, is there not a cause? Is there not something to be done? Is there not something to be accomplished? So when the giant came, the challenge that would define his life forever, David did not hesitate because he had already been tried by God in a circumstance that was similar to this. And so when he came to this Goliath and he saw this guy out there, all he saw was defeated bears and defeated lions. That's all he saw. He wasn't looking down at this giant. He, I don't think it even crossed David's mind one time that he could lose this fight. I think as soon as he stepped up on the ridge and he looked down and he saw the Philistine down there, he looked at that guy and he thought, I'm going to kill that guy. I think from the very beginning. It's one of the most amazing things about David is that there was no doubt in his mind. I mean, when Saul asked him, you know, he's like, hey, I will go. If nobody else will do it, I will go and I will defeat this Philistine. That 
is because he already knew the God that he served. He had already proved the God that he had served. He counts it all joy that he fell into all these different trials because those trials worked patience and patience worked wisdom. And now as he's looking down, his wisdom tells him out of a lifestyle that demonstrates he has a desire to seek after God that I can have belief and faith and trust in God. So I'm going to praise him for what's about to happen. It's the difference. That's the difference between a solid, mature, discipled, working believer and a nominal Christian that comes to church on Sunday just to kind of get their church done. It's the difference. Because when this person, the nominal Christian, faces that adversary that seems insurmountable, they will shrink to the challenge because they have not proven God. But that person that is serving God and demonstrates a lifestyle that has a desire to seek after God, that person who has slain the lion, that person who has slain the bear, that person who gives God the glory for all of those things, when he sees that giant, when he sees that insurmountable task, he says, I don't know what's going to happen, but I know God's going to get the glory out of it. It's a whole different mindset. It's a paradigm shift and the way that you think about the world in general. And that goes so far in reach. We're going to talk about it here in a minute. David didn't wait till game day to get prepared, in other words. That desire to seek after God is a daily thing. And you're not always going to face a giant every day. But the difference between him and the rest of those guys was is that he had already faced the giants. He had already done the work. He came into this day prepared he had watched the game film. He had been monitoring the stats. He knew all that was going on. I mean, he didn't really need a whole lot of work to get into that. He just knew that when he stood on the ridge and he looked down, this was his game plan. God's going to deliver me from him. Just like he delivered me from the lion, just like he delivered me from the bear, he's going to deliver me from this guy. That's... It's bonkers, isn't it? When was the last time you faced a challenge like that? Don't answer, just think about it. When was the last time that an adversary rose up in your life or a challenge rose up in your life and you looked at that challenge and you said, the same God that delivered me from this situation and the same God that delivered me from this situation will deliver me from this situation as well. I know because I believe that he will and I've seen him do it. It's hard. It's hard. Fear can cripple us for sure. You will never rise to the level of your expectations. You will always fall to the level of your training. A lot of you guys are really familiar with this quote. It's absolutely true. You will fall to the level of your training. I read, I've, I read a book, I forget the guy's name who wrote it, but it was a book called On Combat. Amazing book. Guy that wrote, who is it? Grossman, Colonel Grossman, that's right. And uh, he's going through there and he's demonstrating some of the things that happen, you know, like in combat and how combat affects people. And there was this uh, department in California, there was a bullet shortage or something and they were wanting to save money. So they decided that they would start training with finger guns, believe it or not. Yes, this is an actual true story. And uh, so they started training. All their training was with finger guns as they were doing like moving around and stuff. Well, there came a time there was an actual shooting and one of the officers, when the shooting happened, he actually pulled out his finger gun to engage the criminal. You will never rise to the level of your expectations. You will always fall to the level of your training. And if you are not living a lifestyle that demonstrates that you have a desire to seek after God that then provides you with the courage and faith and belief that you need to praise God when those adversaries raise up, you will fall to the level of your training. You will never rise to the level of your expectations. A lot of people, they never read their Bible, they never pray, they never do anything at church, they never try to do any kind of service at all to try and get engaged with God's people, they never really put any effort into it, and then when the trial comes along, they just have this kind of fantasy 
That somehow when that trial comes along, they're just going to rise up like David and slay this giant. And guys, I'm telling you right now, that will not happen. You will fall to the level of your training every single time. And this is why you get embittered Christians that feel like, oh, well, God wasn't there for me for that moment. No, you just didn't know the God that you thought that you served. It's got a lot less to do with about how hurt that you are because God or the church or Christians weren't there for you. It's got a lot less to do with that than, than you having unfair expectations because you have no idea what it means to serve God and what it means to serve God's people. You'll understand that if you start serving God's people and you start working with God's people, there's going to be moments where you're going to be disappointed 100% of the time because they're people. Those are just opportunities for you to demonstrate that you have a lifestyle that is desiring to seek God. All of those are. And those, all of those moments are adversaries that rise against you that you then have the ability to courageously confront and to defeat with whatever God's given you to do that. Desire, seek, and live. So this is how it works, right? Obedience, prayer, and communication, testing, building, and preparing. These are all the desire and seek portion of your life. When you are living in obedience to God, when you are in prayerful communication with him, when you are being tested by him, when he is building you up in discipleship, when he's preparing you for battle, all of you guys right now, you should consider this moment in time where you're sitting in this congregation listening to this word as being prepared for the next conflict that's coming your way because you will experience conflict and how you deal with that conflict will all be based on how much you desire and seek after God and how well you are prepared by the act of obedience to confront that adversary, that difficulty, that trial. And then it goes on that you'll have a time where there'll be a need for courage. Happens to everybody. There'll be a time where you have to make a decision. Will I shrink in fear or will I rise to the challenge in, in spite of my fear and have courage in the face of fear and have courage, trust, and then victory. This is the path that David took. David took the path of desiring to seek after God and living a lifestyle that desired to seek after God so that when the time of challenge came, he was prepared and ready for battle. His obedience to the word of God, his obedience to the will of God, all of those things added in to the equation when he stood on the field and he looked down at the giant and everybody else was shrinking away from this powerful adversary who was standing there. When everybody else was kind of falling to the wayside, David looked down and he said, is there not a cause? I love comic books. I like, the, I like the idea of comic books because they bring drama to art. Which, I mean, if you're not an artist, you may not understand this, but, but there's, a certain, there's a certain drama that is established in panels of, of art. You know, and if you just look at this imagery Look at that first image. I think the artist captured that perfectly. David standing there, just staring down the giant. There's no fear or doubt or worry in that stance. He's prepared. He's fought the lion, he's fought the bear. So when that guy is staring down at him, that guy that has made every other man in Israel flee in fear, David stands before him, even though he's overshadowed by him and in front of all of those people with all of those consequences and all of, that, all of the, the stakes that are, that are at stake here. He only thinks to himself one thing. The battle is the Lord's. I was talking to the guys yesterday.
about the world that we live in. It, it seems a lot of times insurmountable. Like you look at like racism or you look at gender identity or you look at the LGBTQ movement or you look at riots or you look at the judicial system or you look at Congress or you look at the president, you look at our state government or you look at any number of things that are going on out in this world today and you might think to yourself, what can one person do? And you hear somebody come along and they'll say, you know what you should do is you should write a letter to your representative if they do something that you don't agree with. And you know, nine times out of 10 people won't do it. You know why they won't do it? Because my letter doesn't mean anything, it's one letter. They're not even gonna read it, they're not even gonna look at it. If I wrote a letter to Nancy Pelosi, she's not even gonna see it. You're probably right. But see, that's the problem with that mentality is, is that if everybody thinks that way, then nobody writes any letters. If everybody thinks that way, then nobody looks at the insurmountable thing and says, is there not a cause? And so you see morality decline. And you see abortion rates go up. And you see murder rates go up. And you see theft and, 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 and all of the things that go along with, with an immoral society. You see these things increase as God's word continues to decrease and truth begins, continues to decrease, and the desire to be a purveyor of truth begin, continues to decrease, and you think to yourself, well, what's one letter going to do? What's one phone call? What's, gonna, what's, what's that going to do? What's one email going to do? Well, one email or one text or one phone call, you're right. Maybe it doesn't do anything. Or maybe if everybody decided that it was important enough my one letter was important enough my one email was important enough my one phone call was important enough that i believe that it will make a difference we we in today's society in christian society we look at all the things that stand in front of us and we shrink back thinking that's too big i can't do anything about that I'll just wait until the next time I vote. Well, that's just one stone in your arsenal. God can do such amazing things through us. You don't know what God's gonna do with that one letter. You don't know what God's gonna do with that one email. You don't know what God's gonna do with that one phone call or that one text. You, don't, you have no idea what God's gonna do with that. But coming at it from the standpoint that, well, I'm writing this letter, but I know nothing's going to happen, so what's the point? You know, it's kind of like going to God in prayer and saying, God, we really want this person to be healed, but we know you're not going to do it, so whatever. Instead of writing the letter and putting it in the mail and saying, God, your will be done. The battle is yours. What if every believer in the United States of America had the tenacity, had the guts, had the desire to just take the extra step? And instead of looking at a problem like social justice, and thinking it's too big, there's nothing that I can do. Or instead of looking at a situation like abortion and thinking it's too big, what can I do? Or instead of looking at a, at a, at a federal government that is, that is inundated by, 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 by socialists and by people that don't believe in truth and looking at it and thinking it's too big, there's nothing that I can do about it. Instead of looking at those things and thinking there's nothing that I can do about it, why don't you start by coming to the table and saying, is there not a cause? Who are these people that defy the living God of America? The living God of the world? Are we not representatives of an almighty God? Are we not representatives of a sovereign God? Are we not representatives of the man Christ Jesus who came to the earth to die for the sins of all mankind? Are we not representatives of that? Are we not people of the word that believe in truth? Are we not people of the word that believe in justice and equity as far as what the Bible promotes that to be? Are we not these people? 
So when we look at these circumstances, do we look at them and shrink back and say, well, this is too big, I can't do anything about it? Or we stand on the ridge and we look down at it and we said, the, the battle is the Lord's. Is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? And I'm saying to you that there is. I'm saying to you that there, we have a lot to lose. I'm saying to you that we have the most amazing freedom. More freedom than any other church in history has ever enjoyed. The question is, is what do we do with that? Can you imagine what would happen if we lost our ability to worship freely? If we lost our right to freedom of religion, what would happen? You know, we always think of like in small terms, but yeah, we wouldn't be able to meet. We'd have to meet in secret maybe. You know, we'd have to survive or whatever the case may be. You don't even consider the millions upon millions upon millions upon millions of dollars that is pumped into foreign missions from the United States of America. It's not just us. It's not just our little world that is affected. If, if, if we lost the freedom to worship the way that we choose, we lose way more than just Athel Baptist Church. We may lose Uganda. We may lose Nigeria. We may lose Brazil. We may lose, I mean, can you imagine a world where the Philippines becomes the center of national missions in the world? Could happen. They already send missionaries to the United States of America. What I'm saying is, and what I'm asking is, is, the, is there not a cause? Is there not something that's important enough for all of us to decide that it's time to be done with passive Christianity and it's time to speak out and make a little noise? Which is really what 2022 is going to be all about. It's time. It's time, believer. It's time to rise from your apathy. It's time to rise from your fear. It's time to rise from your doubt. And it's time to stand on the ridge and it's time to look down at the giant and think to yourself, is there not a cause? The same God that delivered me from every other trial that I have ever faced is the same God that will deliver me from this giant too. Let's pray. Father, this world is so complicated. And we know that you have given us a mission and you've given us what it is that we are supposed to do. You've given us the rules. You have given us the truth found in your word. There should be no doubt as to what every believer in the world should be focusing on and should be doing. There should be no doubt what priorities that we have. Should be no doubt at all, but it seems like, Father, that that Christianity is just is just filled with doubt and with fear. We're facing many giants in our world today as far as Christianity is concerned. As far as being a follower of your son, Jesus Christ, is concerned, there's so many challenges that we face. Adversaries that rise against us, trials that come our way. Father, we need now more than ever a army of believers that desire to seek after you and that live a lifestyle 
that demonstrate a desire to seek after you so that when that moment comes, when our courage is tested, that we will trust, that we will obey, and we will have courage in the face of it. That we will look down and we will not shrink in terror, that we will not hide in fear, but that we will stand boldly upon the mountaintop and we will praise your name for all the things that you have done and all the things that you are going to do through us. It's time that your churches rise up and become represented to promote biblical truth to promote moral absolutes, to promote absolute truth, to promote the idea that there is a heaven to gain and that there is a hell to shun and that there is a pathway from hell to heaven and his name is Jesus Christ. Father, I hope that I speak for everyone in this room today when I say, that we're tired of passive Christianity. 